Hi everyone, it's Professor Katie King. Um, today we're going to be talking about chapter one from uh, Andrea Lunsford's Everything is an Argument. In a moment I will be putting it on share screen so that I can go over the PowerPoint notes with you so that you can have access to those. Um, the great thing about this is that you'll be able to pause whenever you need to pause to take notes. Um, which something from my in-class face-to-face classes I'm sure students would be really jealous of because I tend to go a little bit quickly um, sometimes with some of the things that I talk about. So I'm going to put it on share screen and I'm going to start going over the PowerPoints with you. Um, and if you have questions about these, uh, just make sure to uh, message me or email me um, and we can address those. All right. And if you hear any noise, it's probably either my dogs or my drunken neighbors. So uh, just bear with. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna move it to the PowerPoint here. Um, I'll just do desktop so that we can all kind of see what's going on here. And then I'll move this to a slideshow. So in chapter one, um, the great thing about this chapter is it kind of gives a very broad and general overview of almost the entire book. Um, so it's a great place to start, but that also means there's gonna be a little bit of an information dump today. So I'll try to go as quickly as I can. Remember, you are more than welcome to pause where you need to pause. So first off, we need to start with two premises. Uh, the first one is that arguments are all around us. Um, and that anything can be a text. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. If anything can be a text, right? If um, this wasp and hornet killer is a text, then we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean, right? If this is an argument, what's the argument going on here, right? Well, the argument is if you use this, right, it's gonna kill those pesky bugs uh, living around your house, right? Um, but it was created deliberately. Somebody came up with the formula that kills the bug. Somebody tested that formula out. Somebody created uh, this uh, cover here, right? To kind of draw your eye with the bright colors. Um, you know, they made it kind of with a nice far shooting thing to kill a wasp because no one wants to get up close to a wasp and kill it, right? So that's an argument. It may seem strange that like these arbitrary objects that we look at are our arguments, but anything that can be dis constructed deliberately can be a text. And if anything that's constructed deliberately is a text, then anything is an argument. I was a really famous poem called A Jar in Tennessee uh, that really kind of plays with this concept of like, what is natural and what is what is human made, right? What is created? And anything that is created affects the rest of the world in such a way to where it changes the whole landscape, right? And that's what arguments do. Um, so like if you look at <coughs> the example here on this page, right? If we were to just look at the Instagram photo itself, right? The argument that's being presented to us is, wow, this, this woman or this person is a really great yogi or, I don't know, athlete. I don't know what you'd call this person. But um, if you look beyond the text, right, to the context, what we'll find out is called the context, you see that, in fact, this person's getting help, right, uh, from a friend and that is not in the in the text itself, right? So in other words, arguments not only um, present themselves in a certain way to us, but they change the more we know about what's going on with the text. And that's gonna be a cornerstone of this class is research, right? And research allows you um, to see outside of the text, right? So like without research, all we see is the Instagram photo. With research, by understanding the, the broader connections that the text makes, we're seeing beyond it, right? We still see the text itself, but then we see everything else surrounding it. So that's why research is so important. Um, okay, let me go to the next slide. So why do we argue? This is basically, I'm gonna rattle through these. So again, feel free to uh, pause where you need to. We have all different reasons as to why we argue. Uh, the first ones, the first 
reason is to convince, right? That we are true or that we are correct. We do this all the time. Um, you know, by follow my political party because it's correct or buy my brand of salami because it's the best or, you know, listen to my band because we're better than these other bands, like whatever it may be, right? We, we want people to be convinced to our side. Um, there's, there are also arguments to inform, right? Hey, did you know that this thing exists? And if you didn't, it's pretty cool, right? Um, just like me telling you that research is important to understand the greater context, right? That's an argument to inform. I'm telling you, hey, this thing called research exists. You should do it for your essays. Um, arguments to persuade, that goes beyond just saying, hmm, okay, I agree, and I actually want you to start moving toward doing, right? Because if we think about argument, uh, it's great when we can agree, right? Or at least understand someone's point of view, because those two are very different things, but both valid. Um, but when we actually kind of start moving in the direction of, hey, I will act on this thing that the person says for me to act on, that's incredibly powerful, right? To get people to be able to argue so well that you get people to do stuff that agrees with what you believe, that's really powerful. Um, more, there are plenty of these. So again, I'm gonna hustle through them. Um, there are also arguments to make decisions, right? Um, coming to a conclusion by considering the alternative. So let's say like you are, having trouble with your spouse, your partner, whoever, and you go to couples therapy, right? And you go through all this couples therapy and the, the therapist eventually says, okay, like, well, what are we going to do, right? Are you going to stay together? Are you going to get divorced? Are you going to live together for now for the kids? And then a few years down the road, you know, move out. Are you going to be friends? Are you never speaking to each other again, right? So in other words, like, what's this decision that we're coming to within this issue? Um, we also have arguments to understand and explore. Again, this is research. This is what research helps us to do. Um, because a lot of times we think all research is meant to do is support the argument we already have. But a lot of times we're like, I don't know how I feel about this thing. I have to find out more. I have to explore more. And so research allows you to gain a greater understanding of concepts, of items, of arguments, of texts, and once you know those facts, right? Once you understand those hidden, uh, those things that were hidden to you anyway, right? Like, it's not like someone is like sitting in the library going like, well, I'm not gonna let these kids, you know, or adults read what's in my book, right? Like hidden in the sense that like, you didn't know about it before. Um, invitational arguments are where we are inviting others to walk in our shoes. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of coverage lately um, of the Black Lives Matter movement and really what the, the Black Lives Matter movement now does a lot of different things, but at its core, it's an invitational argument. It's asking people who do not exist in this country or in this world, right, as Black people to understand what it is like to exist in reality as a Black person, right? So someone from Black Lives Matter comes to me and uses the hashtag Black Lives Matter, what's embedded in that argument is them telling me, okay, here is some information, right, of what it's like to be a Black person in the United States, white Professor King, like, then why don't you look at this information to try to get a better understanding of what walking in my shoes would look like. We also have Rogerian arguments. We're gonna talk about all of these in greater depth. So if, you, if you're like, whoa, this is info dump today. Yes, I get it. Um, but all of this will be covered in greater depth. Again, chapter one is like the, you know, the, the, the buffet, the sizzler buffet of the entire book uh, of Lunsford. So um, we're just kind of getting little pieces here and there. Um, so anyway, Rogerian arguments, right? Talking about divorce again, I'm, it's not like it's on the brain or anything. I'm, I'm a lonely old dog lady. But um, if you think about like counselors, marriage counselors, ombudsmen, sports agents, 
they, you know, lawyers, they have to negotiate usually between two parties to find common, common ground and to establish trust, or at very least, to at least create an understanding of where one another, <coughs> excuse me, is coming from. So in Rogerian arguments, that's what we're doing. We're trying to find common ground to establish that trust. Uh, this comes from a psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers, who um, kind of innovated the humanist, humanistic field branch of psychology in the mid 20th century. Um, you know, really kind of, um, if any of you are, are psych majors and you've heard the term unconditional positive regard, he's essentially like the granddaddy of that concept. So, um, so that's where this comes from. So respect is a big thing in Rogerian arguments. Um, or there are arguments to meditate or pray, right? Um, when we when we meditate, when we pray, when we call out to a sort of larger metaphysical or physical force, um, you know, we're arguing. We're arguing. We're trying to ask for something or be thankful for something or deliberate about something. But, you know, that's what we're doing. So we talked about why we argue. Now we have to talk about occasions for argument. Um, there's a really great old Albie Shore song called I Only Think of You on Two Occasions. And the answer to that is day and night, right? So if that helps, if you ever listen to Albie Shore, I only think of you. I know you want to hear my, me saying that's, that's really what this English class is about. Um, he's talking about times, right? Like it can be times of the day, times of a historical period, times in someone's life. But occasion talks about time. So we're talking about past, present, future, um, or tense, I guess would be a better word than like a specific time. Um, so what is, what, we're gonna talk a lot about this term rhetoric, first and foremost. And we have to understand that rhetoric is the art of persuasion. Um, and it comes from the Greek rhetorike, which means public speaking, okay? Um, and so, when we're trying to persuade, we have to think of when the best occasion to do that is, right? We already came up with why we're gonna argue. Now we have to think, when's the, when's, when, when do we strike while the iron's hot, so to speak, right? And different occasional arguments, different occasions for argument do different things, right? You have forensic arguments. And so if anyone's involved in forensics, um, they're looking at something that happened, happened in the past and talking about, you know, not just its present day effects, but what we can kind of then pivot toward for the future, right? Um, but trials, right? If somebody uh, was murdered and they tried to find out who the killer was, right? <clears throat> they have to use forensic evidence, meaning they have to piece together what they have to kind of create a timeline for what happened in that past moment. Um, so forensic arguments are arguments about the past. Deliberative arguments, when we're deliberating, we're trying to think about what to do in the future, right? What we're, what we're doing next, right? So like, you know, the, the old cliche of the partners going, what are we gonna have for dinner, right? That's a deliberative argument. And of course, right, the kind of sexist trope to that is like, oh, well, the woman will just say whatever you want and then that argument will go nowhere. Um, so that's a deliberative argument. What should we have for dinner? What will we have for dinner, right? But it can be much more important than that, right? Like what will we do with these police departments, right? Or what should we do in the next presidential election, right? We're talking about the future. Um, and then we have epideptic or ceremonial arguments. And those are arguments about the present um, to essentially usually commemorate some sort of present event, right? So graduation speeches, inaugural addresses, eulogies, those are things that um, are, are given at the time of the event, right? Like at the, at the commencement ceremony is when this speech is given, at the funeral is when this eulogy is given, right? At the inaugurating of the president is when this inauguration speech is given. So it's like to say like, here, this moment is special and here's why. So, <laughs> Next, we talked about why we're arguing. We talked about the best time to argue, right? Now we have to ask questions of stasis, right? 
And by stasis, we're talking about sort of being, right? Questions of being. Um, and we also, when we think about stasis, we want to think about like, you know, I always think about like homeostasis where things are sort of balanced, right? Um, we're always really looking for balance in an argument because what an argument is by its very nature is, you know, it's taking something where this person feels this way, this person feels this way and tries to at least create that common ground, right? Tries to have people see eye to eye. Um, so we have four questions of stasis. The first one is, did something happen, right? Arguments of fact. And I should probably update this because back in the day, right, like climate change was a little more contentious. Um, but now we've essentially all agreed that, you know, climate change is real, I hope. Um, please, no flat earthers out there. Um, but climate change is real. And, uh, you know, but now our questions are like, well, what caused, right, these global climate crises? Was it uh, crude oil? You know, the use of crude oil? Was it, um, you know, uh, the, I don't, I don't even know, the the killing off of species? Was it this? Was it, did this country do worse than these other countries? So those lead to arguments of fact, which is this is a thing, right? This is happening. So there we go. Um, the next question of stasis is what is the nature of the thing? And those are arguments of definition, right? Um, a really kind of, you know, easy example is like the pro-choice, pro-life debate. If you think that life begins at conception, then you are probably going to define, you know, uh, uh, an, you know, an embryo or a fetus or a zygote at any stage as a, as a living human child, right? Because you believe life begins at conception. If you believe life begins at birth, right? Then you are, you are more likely to be swayed to the pro-choice side, which is, you know, that that's not a human until it, is actually like walking around or no, not walking. I mean, it's not like babies walk out of the womb, but when it's a living thing living outside of the womb. <clears throat> and arguments of definition will lead us to um, causal arguments. They'll lead us to deliberative arguments, right? So some of the, a lot of these things, don't think of all of these as like separate categories. Think of how all of these things, these different arguments or aspects of argument how they all weave together and they, they, they're a network that affects one another, right? In the same way that like, if you break your leg, a lot of times you'll get like back pain because your body's a network or a system that works together. You know, these things do, these types and aspects of argument do the same thing. We'll talk about that all semester. Um, what's the quality or cause of the thing? These are arguments of evaluation, right? <clears throat> so, who's better, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, right? Uh, who's the better rapper, Kanye or Drake, right? You then take these evaluation criteria and you tell us like which one it is. If we're evaluating rappers, right? Who has better beats? Who has better rhymes? Who has um, life experience that would make us sort of believe his credibility a little bit more as a rapper, right? Any, any, any number of evaluative criteria then you gauge whatever you are evaluating, right, against that. Just like your grades, those are evaluation, right? If I'm looking at not only how well you argue, but how grammatically error-free it is, um, how structurally sound it is, right, and how, um, you know, holistically overall it reads, those are my evaluation criteria in grading your essays, right? So what I'm giving, when you earn a grade on an essay, that is my argument of evaluation, right? That's me saying you earn this grade for these following reasons. And every once in a blue moon, someone will say, no, I didn't, right? I earned a better grade and then we'll have that discussion, right? Um, and then finally, the last question of stasis is what action should be taken, right? What do we do? about this thing, right? If I tell you you need to go to the academic support center because it's going to, in, you know, better your chances for a higher grade, that it's gonna help with your writing, that you may meet people, that'll be a great opportunity to know the campus better, right? That's my argument of proposal to you. I propose you go to the academic support center. 
I'm calling you to, to make an action so that it behooves you, right? <clears throat> All right. So next we'll talk about the audience. We have intended audiences, we have invoked audiences, and we have real audiences. Sometimes these overlap, sometimes they don't, right? Um, so my intended audience are the people I wish to reach, but a lot of times, right, those aren't necessarily the people that I reach, right? Um, the people who I actually reach are my real audience, okay? An invoked audience are people who are represented in the text itself. So like Cat Fancy Magazine, right? Or like if you follow, like I'm a total dork and I watch Bravo TV because I love like reality garbage. Yeah. So I follow like, yeah, like Bravo TV Instagram accounts, right? I'm the invoked audience for that because I love Bravo TV, right? Um, but let's say I posted something on my Instagram. Um, let's say I posted some political, you know, diatribe on my Instagram. I would be then talking to my intended audience, right? However, if someone took a screenshot of that and blasted it across the internet, then a bunch of people who were not my Instagram followers, my intended audience, would then have access to that political diatribe. That would then become my real audience. So I want you to pause for a second and think, what might be the problem if we expect our audience to think, act, believe, behave in a certain way, but we don't anticipate that our audience will not be comprised of those people, right? What, in, in other words, like if I'm hoping that these people are my audience, but what actually happens is these people are my audience, what might arise, right? What might happen if I don't anticipate that people who aren't like-minded, um, people who disagree with me, people who come from different walks of life that I do, if they get a hold of the argument that I'm sharing, what might happen? Think about that for a moment. You may want to pause here. But I'll make <laughs> oh, coleslaw. That's my dog. <clears throat> so then we have the context. Remember that picture I showed? Coleslaw, quiet. Remember that picture I showed you about text versus context? This is what we're going to talk about when we get to context. <gasps> hey, quiet. I don't even know where she is hiding under the table or something. Um, so the text is the immediate situation. It's the piece of writing. It's the music video. It's the Instagram image, right? The larger environment in which that situation exists is the context, okay? So you watch a music video, right? You see the rapper with like the hot chick and he's going into the club and like all his friends high five him or whatever, right? That's the text. Now the context can be any number of things, right? It can be, okay, well this rapper, you know, uh, just came out with a new album in which he's trying to show himself off as like this party Lothario, right? Um, because his last album was all gangster rap. So he's going in a new direction, right? That's the context. Um, you know, you, the, <clears throat> all of those things, right? The act, the actor who plays the hot chick in the video, right? The, the actors who play the friends at the club, the club itself, which is a scouted location, right? Those are all elements that are used, constructed artificially, deliberately to create this text, right? <clears throat> so the audience is watching that. And if you're just watching that video, you're going, oh, Rapper X is such a cool dude, right? But what you're not thinking about is what were all of those things that were created or that situation that was existing in order for this text to be created, right? So when you're watching, when you're looking at texts, you have to think, what are my own assumptions? If I'm watching this rap video and I'm going, oh, this is just like every other rap video, right? Like money and loose women and, you know, tough guys and guns or drugs or whatever. Like, you're making assumptions about that, right? That guy, that rapper could be a total dork in every other, not that he's not anyway, but like, he could be like a total, totally different person in every other aspect of his life. But because you're only looking at that text in front of you and not considering all of that context, 
you're relying on your assumptions, right? And so we have to get out of that. That's why research is so important. It allows us to look at context. It allows us to see the bigger picture, right? To see the complex nature of everything and not just stereotype it, right? Not just whittle it down to what we think it is. Um, you know, if you look at this image here, right? Like if, if, if we were to just look at this, the shot itself inside the screen, right? It looks like the, the person on the left is murdering the person on the right. But if we pan out to the larger context, we see that actually the exact opposite is true. And the reason why this is so important, especially right now in 2020, or whenever you're watching this video, is that so many of the texts that we get in our lives want to obliterate context, right? We want to whittle it down to, uh, you know, the, the tweet. We want to whittle it down to the Instagram image. We want to whittle it down to um, 140 characters or less, or the sound bite, right? And the problem with that is it does not allow complexity, right? It does not, it does not allow for us to really look at the, you know, the, the incredibly complex history, biography, social setting, physical setting, you know, generational setting that, that any text that's created uh, exists in, right? It just has us look at this very narrow understanding of this thing. And so context is vital when we are looking at argument. It perhaps is the most vital thing that allows us to consider incredibly complex arguments. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about these in the next classes. So again, I'll go really quickly with this. But when we're talking about Kairos, we're talking about uh, the best time, place, and opportunity to make an argument, right? So it's not just the, the occasion in terms of time, it's the best time, place, and opportunity, right? So it has to do with occasion, but it goes beyond that. So if I were arguing, let's say for, you know, women don't need husbands or women should work in the workforce, you'd be like, yeah, of course, like we've been doing that for years, right? Um, and if I especially talked about, you know, the differences between women and men, a lot of people would say, well, hold up, right? What about people who are gender non-conforming? What about people who are trans? What, are, what about people who are gender non-binary, right? <clears throat> What about people who are agender, or gender fluid, right? So in other words, if I'm using these old outdated models to construct an argument, my audience is immediately gonna go, wait a second, I'm not listening because you're kind of in, living in the past, right? And so I have, to, I have to keep that in mind. What I also have to keep in mind is who I am, who my audience is, and how I best persuade them, right? So I have to consider, if I'm thinking about who I am, what is my credibility, what, right? What's my appeal to credibility? How do you know, how do you in cyberspace know that I'm not just some whack job who walked into a house, got on the person's laptop after a few drinks at the local bar and decided to make a video and post it to this class, right? You need to know the credibility of the people who are sharing arguments with you. Because wouldn't it be terrifying if after these, you know, six or so weeks in summer school or 16 weeks if we're in fall or spring, wouldn't it be terrifying that at the end of that semester, somebody came to you and said, oh, that person was an imposter the whole time. So everything you did for this 103 class doesn't count and you have to do it over again, right? Like, so we don't think that ethos is a big deal, but it can be, it can be a huge deal. So it's our job as the audience to figure out, is this person credible, right? Like, should I believe this person's argument? What do I know about this person? What can I find out about this person? <clears throat> the next one is pathos, right? That's appealing to any number of emotions. Comedians utilize a lot of pathos, but so do, you know, so does the ASPCA with, you know, the commercial with the dog in the snowstorm missing an eye, right? Like adopt this dog. So it's, it's, it's hinging a hope that emotions will persuade people, right? And again, it's not just sadness, it's not just happiness, but it's emotions like fear, right? Um, 
I mean, even hunger, shoot, like how many times, how many, how many of us have been able to persuade people just by feeding them first, right? So being able to appeal to emotions is very powerful. But most importantly for this class, we have to appeal to people's logic. And that doesn't just mean data and statistics and information, right? It's not just about the info dump. It's also about making, crit critically thinking, making logical steps in our argument to where pe one, people can follow us, but more importantly, if they can follow us and they understand what we're saying and it makes sense and it's logically sound, guess what they'll probably do next? That's right, they'll agree with us or they may even act on it, right? So logic is the most important in this class of the three appeals, so keep that in mind. So what does this all constitute? Well, this constitutes the rhetorical situation. Again, rhetoric meaning argument, meaning the art of argument. Um, and that is a living thing, right? It's always changing. The arguments that exist today are not the arguments that existed uh, in the same form 100, 200, 500 years ago, nor will the arguments 100, 200, 500 years from now be the same in the same form as they exist today, right? It's all changing. Cultures change, values change, societies change, people change, places change. So with every other change, arguments change as well, right? They are living dynamic things. They are not in a vacuum. Um, and so that's kind of what we're talking about here. I'll take it back off the share screen um, because that's the PowerPoint. It's probably a million hours long. Sorry about that. I told you it was going to be a little bit of an info dump, but um, that is, you know, that's what we're working with here. So um, again, if you have questions about chapter one, um, feel free to, to message me, to email me. But again, <coughs> also know that chapter one is this very long broad overview of everything we'll be learning this semester so if you don't if you're not an expert on you know rogerian arguments today don't worry we'll have time to cover them as the course goes on um thank you so much for listening and following along um and uh yeah have a wonderful rest of your day